Automatic egg boiler and patent number one, the city map. Adam Hart Davis pedals around Britain, uncovering these and other scientific milestones in half an hour. Now on to, in the last of the current series, Close Up North visits the threatened community of Spurnhead. All ships, the river broadcast, Spurn Point, the wind is south-east four, all roads east, south-east three, and it's moderate visibility. Ships, BDS Humber, Channel 12 for the river broadcast. Spurn Point, home to a remarkable seafaring community. Stranded at the end of a three mile long spit of sand and shingle, they safeguard the shipping channels that carry a quarter of Britain's trade. Forecast for the river, southwest, two or three, fair weather and moderate or good visibility. But this is a community on the brink, its very survival threatened by the sea itself. Spurn's about to be surrendered to the waves, the cost of new tidal defences exceeding its value. But tonight, Close Up North reveals the people of the peninsula may not be the only ones paying the price. And Brian Bevan takes the Humber lifeboat out on exercise. Humber Coast Guard, Humber Coast Guard, Humber Coast Guard. It's the Humber lifeboat, Humber lifeboat, calling radio check channel zero. How are you being, please? Over. Humber lifeboat, this is Humber Coast Guard. You're unclear. How are you, over? This is the last time the Humber lifeboat crew will take their Aran class boat to sea. After 10 years and nearly 500 launches, they're about to collect its replacement, a new, faster vessel costing £1.3 million. Pounds. The biggest advantage will be the speed because it's as uh, third of fasting in. It's so 25 knots full speed, the new boat. This one, say, 17, 18 knots. So the speed is the biggest advantage. We're all looking forward now to going in. Six days a week, 24 hours a day, Spurn's lifeboat crew must stay within running distance of their boat. Their families share the isolation of living at the end of the point. The crew is unique. They're the RNLI's only professional lifeboatmen. Take that one in. Yeah, Chub. Yeah, see you later. Radio. Cheers, Nick. Cheers. Thank you very much. I'll see you later on. Once a week, on average, they're called from their homes, in all weathers, at any time of day or night, to go to the aid of fellow seafarers in distress. for the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and uh, my job varies very, very considerably. I mean, it uh, varies from collecting the fees from cars that are coming onto Spurn to various management works, clearing the buckthorn, um, keeping an eye on the sheep that we have down here. Um, all sorts of maintenance jobs, recording the wildlife as well. It's Brent Geese. Yeah. Well, you've got a great variety of people come. Some migration seasons, you know, spring and autumn, you get bird watchers coming, obviously. Winter time, you get fishermen mainly coming. And also, because of the shape of it, um, on a map, it's a sort of curious place to visit. So you get a lot of sightseers coming to see a, 
It's a curious sight, I suppose. Lots of people come, when they come, they say, oh, I've always wanted to visit Spurn. Um, a lot of them just go down to the car park, the lighthouse, walk all the way around the end on the beach, back to the car, and they've done Spurn. Well, there's the weather front bringing that rain. It moves swiftly out into the North Sea during the course of the afternoon. And then this second system following in behind is going to take its time, eventually bringing rain back into Northern Ireland and Scotland earlier on this evening. And the winds do remain strong from the south or southwest right the way through the day. The lighter winds are much further east, and that's probably where we'll see the best of the sunshine this afternoon. The sunshine, though, fairly weak. I suppose we're unusual because we're the only full-time station in the country. And... Uh... Basically, that is because of the isolation of the place. You have to swim. No, no, I won't have to swim. There's seven crew members and the families live at Spurn in uh, houses provided by the RNLI. It's certainly a very tiring job. And uh, some people, you know, just don't like it at all. I mean, they've come from the towns and cities and... If they don't like the quietness, I mean, there's, there's no use coming to Spurn. I mean, it really is quiet sometimes, and uh, some of them haven't been able to cope and had to leave. And then again, we've got other families that have been here, you know, quite a lot of years now that have coped with the quietness and isolation. You, you have to have some sort of hobby. If you don't have one, you've got that much free time on your hands that it, it just doesn't work. You seem to get under the wife's feet too much. It's killing that free time that you have to do. I mean, you can sit in your house if you was that sort and just watch telly all day if you wanted to. But, I mean, it certainly wouldn't uh, agree with you, especially this modern day of age of eating. You soon become a couch potato, right? Actually maintaining the boat, we go on three times a week. We do a, a plan maintenance. And actually actually doing that takes up sort of like maybe two or three hours the three days that you go on. And then the rest of the time is just waiting for a call off. The whole life is revolved around the humble lifeboat. The whole life is geared to the humble lifeboat. Uh, unfortunately for our families, it gets a bit to be Fanatical, really. Well, my wife's got a little snack bar, which uh, she runs just outside the station here, and she gets me in there helping her with that. Don't leave drinks straight in the cabinet. Yeah, please. You know, without a good wife, you can't do this job. We came down here because of the lifeboat, and if that's what Dave wants to do, then we've just grown along with it. You know, I'll never get jealous of it. The Humber is unique. Um, the boat is in the right position. And uh, to get the crew as near to the boat, we've had to establish this lifeboat community on Spurn Head with all its problems. We've looked at alternative sites up the river, but you've got to go so far up um, that you're taking yourself away from the scene of action. Tony Gratsky parties on Spurn. Uh, Rover control. Control the Rover. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you deal with the Leningradsky Partisan, please? It's just coming up to the Bullboy outward bound. The Leningradsky Partisan, Roger. It's between 25 and 26,000 pilotage movements a year here. Yeah. Much more than a lot of other places. Yeah, there's nowhere as busy as this. Except for Europe, or maybe, or somewhere like that, but nowhere in the UK. 170 pilots guide ships up the Humber. The estuary's tides are fast, its natural channels are narrow. Unlike many rivers, it needs little dredging, but its bed is littered with wrecks. It's a small gas tanker, and it's a foreign crew, I believe. And it'll be unfamiliar with the, the river and the currents. And from here, we'll be going about five miles backwards again to the, to the anchorage. And we have a large number of ports and docks and jetties uh, in the estuary itself. 
So it presents a, an interesting uh, challenge to anybody who wants to be a pilot here. And um, indeed it takes many years to become a senior pilot because of it. Control, control, thank you. In many places the waterways are restricted by uh, sandbanks and obstructions. Although it looks very wide and uh, benign on a summer's afternoon, um, the actual area that you can go um, with a ship depends on its draft. We get lots of uh, changes in uh, the sandbanks and the channel. About four years ago, we actually moved from the south side uh, past the Humber Bridge to the north side because we lost the channel there and we're now going around the north side of the river and across the Whittons. So it's a very interesting uh, estuary from a navigation point of view. Spurn Point is right out, if you like, in the North Sea, so we don't have far to run with our launches to pick up ships. We can watch them over what is quite a difficult and dangerous approach to the estuary. It gives us a, a unique uh, advantage um, if we weren't there, then the nearest place I think that we could be is Grimsby, which is six miles or so further inland um, and would take away our ability to monitor the traffic properly and to ensure safety of navigation, not just for piloted ships, but for every ship that uses the estuary. Grimsby, a week to go before the new lifeboat is ready. All right, good morning, chaps. Um, Having covered everything so far, all the equipment, there's just a case of more practice and hands-on for you. Use all the equipment, particularly at the back end with the three integrated, the, the GPS, the laser plot and the radar working together, put plans in and out. A mobile classroom's been brought in to help them master the technology of the new okay, boat. Right, off we go then. Five, three, zero, yeah, you want three, zero, five, zero, 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 zero. And these are local one, it's just out of Grimsby up to Bridlington. Right. Well, they can get to within five metres of any point, but uh, more importantly, uh, they have the means, that if the yachtsman, bless him, is not pat particularly sure of where he is, they have the means to find him much more efficiently by using the equipment. They can, if you like, if there are 10 radar contacts, they can very quickly discover which of those 10 is the yachtsman in trouble and they'll forget to them much more quickly. Barry Spence is Spurn's only other resident. Since he arrived here 30 years ago as the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust's full-time warden, he's seen huge areas of the peninsula claimed by the sea. Well, I suppose the main changes are the actual erosion of the land at the top end of the peninsula where I live in particular. Uh, the actual cliff edge compared now compared with when I first came is all this, what, 150 metres, I think, gone all told. Um, well, this is the new piece of the road that was put in last year, almost exactly 12 months ago. This was to replace a piece that was washed away to our right. Uh, most of this was destroyed around about 1991. The, the very first breach in this piece of road was 1978, and then we had little damage for about 10 or 15 years, and then since then we've had an increasing amount. You seem to get periods of erosion, very rapid erosion in a few months, and you might go for several years with hardly any at all. I arrived in 1964, and I think the edge of the dunes would be out where the water's breaking on the shore now. And that was actually solid sand dunes all the way across, right the way across here. And, uh, well, you can see that now we're down to bare clay. When all the sand has been stripped off the beach, like here, you've got some, a bare clay base. You get all the sand uh, suspended in the seawater. It acts, as the waves run up and down, it acts like a sandpaper. It then strips the top of the clay off. And obviously, when it runs around boulders like this, it must create a, some sort of current that leaves a little pillar. And as it strips off, it builds higher and higher until it gets so far, and then obviously, it's going to take that out as well. 
Pool in Dorset, headquarters of the RNLI, and the new seven-class Humber lifeboat is ready at last. Beautiful, isn't she? Yeah, spot on. The name says it all, doesn't it? Proud of the Humber. Excellent. Beautiful boat, isn't she? Big. Let's get at it. Yeah. <laughs> mean machine. Not bad at all. For the first time in 10 years, the entire Humber lifeboat crew have left their station together. A stand-in crew covering the estuary until their return after the sea trials. They have four days to master their new vessel. New course, Chris. 286 when you rounded the boy. 